Okay, this is a short video on wildlife photography and looking at some of the concepts related to um, doing successful wildlife photography. So, <clears throat> wildlife photography is about capturing animals in their natural habitat. Um, the animals are often photographed in action, such as eating, fighting, uh, or in flight. Alternatively, portraits can be used to show detail or emotion. Um, so, going to the zoo and taking a photo of an animal um, from a distance, just sleeping, that's, while it's a photo of a an animal, it's not wildlife photography. Wildlife photography, I mean, being at a zoo, you wouldn't call it wildlife anyway, but I mean, you can get away with doing wildlife photography at the zoo, but it typically needs to be showing animals in, in a way that is, not commonly seen, um, a rarely seen side to the animal, something that's interesting, um, showing them in action, or as, as mentioned here, showing, uh, taking a closer look using a portrait of the animal to show detail on, you know, the, the stripes on their face or uh, an emotional look in their face, you know, um, at a certain time when something's happening. So wildlife photography, yeah, it's about animals, but it's also about showing that animal in their natural habitat, in their in a state in which we as city people don't get to see them in, um, unless we go into that habitat and put ourselves in their world. So it's about, yeah, <clears throat> showing, showing the viewer something that's alien um, or unseen um, to them regularly. So, a uh, wildlife photographer, um, the goal is not just to take, as I said, a pretty picture of an animal, like a pretty animal, pretty picture, that's all well and good, but uh, wildlife, true wildlife photography and good wildlife photography should really show or present a side of that animal that's rarely seen to the audience. So there's six key concepts um, that we'll look at, and these are here. So um, one of the most important tools in a um, wildlife photographer's kit is obviously their equipment and wildlife photography equipment is not cheap typically they'll use obviously they'll have a decent camera but they'll use um, a really long focal length lens so lenses um, with focal lengths up to 400 600 800 uh, millimeters um, and these lenses are obviously not cheap. They're very powerful, strong, and expensive lenses <clears throat> um, because these are people that are doing this professionally. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't take wildlife photography with um, equipment that's available to us. I mean, like the reason why wildlife photographers typically use really long focal length lenses is because they want to be able to stay a distance away from the animal if it's a dangerous animal obviously they need to keep their distance but also to not disturb the animal so the animal isn't disturbed by the presence of a human being in their environment they're not worried about predators coming like you being a predator and um, disturbing them so you're staying a distance away and you're allowing them to just go about their regular business um, without having you disrupting them in the process of doing so. So having a focal, a long focal length allows you to keep your distance while still being able to take a photo where you fill the frame. So this, this person could have stood 100 meters away and using a really long focal length, they can zoom in so much that it makes this animal still appear large. They don't, the photographer didn't have to be three meters away to take that photo. Um, and standing 100 meters away from an animal, the animal is going to react, uh, act very differently to how they would if you were standing three meters away. So that's the point there. Um, so typically, wildlife photographers use really long focal lengths or they s use cameras that have really big zooms, essentially. So they can stand a long distance away and zoom in. Um, there are times when you are able to get up and close to an animal, uh, up close and personal to an animal and use a wide angle lens to create a sort of um, different effect like this, these two images here um, and they are interesting photos um, but they're definitely rarer uh, occasions um, so typically wildlife photography entails using zoom le zoom lenses and long long focal lengths um, depth of field is another thing to consider so the wildlife photographers have these really powerful lenses that also have um, 
the capability to take images with a large depth of field shallow depth of field sorry um, with a large aperture but um, we might not have the capacity to do that with some of our lenses but in saying that if you are taking a photo of an animal so distance and focal length also affect the depth of field so even though you might not have an expensive lens that can go down to 2.8 um, f 2.8 as the aperture this photo for instance could have been still taken at f 9 even maybe even potentially depending on how far away the photographer is from that um, subject so if you're really far distance away from that subject and then the background behind that subject is far away again then you're going to you're going to have that ability to create a shallow depth of field um, or a blurred background even by using a larger larger f numbers um, smaller aperture so um again equipment ideally if you're professional you want those high quality uh, high power and high quality stuff but there is still the capability of taking these sorts of photos just using our regular um, lower end cameras um, I wouldn't suggest trying to capture this sort of stuff with um, phone cameras definitely not this stuff I mean you could probably get away with this maybe even some cameras phone cameras are capable of going wide like this um, but yeah like th this sort of photo anyone can capture using their typical um, like point and shoot camera with a bit like a decent zoom on it you can take a photo like that so um, long story short from everything that I've just sort of summed up essentially best the best setup for wildlife photography is to zoom to use a zoom camera and stand as far away as possible and aim for where possible to have a shallow depth of field so you can draw the attention and focus onto the subject the animal just like this one here lighting is also a big part of um, any photography um, I thought I'd put these two examples here to demonstrate the difference between like two I mean they're not I think this one's a wallaby but they're both essentially kangaroos um, and both captured in the wild in the bush during the daytime but the images have a very different effect um, I mean it is subjective but my opinion is this one's a lot nicer photo and that's mainly because of the lighting I mean both similar animals similar location similar pose looking at the camera but um, this one's a far nicer photo because of that lighting effect that's going on around the edge of the, the animal um, so how do you how can you recreate an image like that well lighting is all especially when you're shooting outdoors it's all about having awareness of the sky like is it an overcloud day how is how is the the sky affecting the the lighting itself where's the sun and what is the sun reflecting off so having an awareness of the sun and the sky and the light source and how that's affecting the image so um, this image here the um, the light it could have been an overcast it look, kind of looks like it was an overcast day to be honest because the shadows are very blurry and there's, they're not defined sort of thing um, so there's no real contrast to the image it kind of looks a bit bland um, also it could have been taken at a time when the sun was directly above so up here and then sh like in in the in the face so shining in the face of the um kangaroos so that it's just direct light and the, the shadows if there are any go behind them um and it's a very flat bland sort of light and it, it minimizes contrast so like although it's still a great photo of these kangaroos in their natural habitat that lighting really makes a difference it looks like a very boring almost image whereas this really there's not much difference to this image again they're still both just animals standing in the wild looking at the camera but that lighting really creates a much stronger contrasting effect in this image so in this case the light source is behind the kangaroo um, and as that light source shines so the sun say for instance is hitting the back of the kangaroo's head and then that light's trickling around and creating that rim light on the sides of the face so think about when you shine a torch um, say say you've got a friend holding it uh, holding a torch and, and a bowl and then you can picture that that torch hitting that bowl it's not just going to be black right you're going to see like that glow that bit of a glowing edge around the bowl that's because a little bit of light spills around 
So that's, we talked about this before, we've called it a rim light. Um, when the back, so when that light comes from behind and it trickles around the sides and creates that glow on the edges, that's called a rim light. And really the only way, the easiest way to create that out in the open is just, so this would be say captured early in the morning or late in the day, when the sun's not directly above, but it's at sort of an angle in the sky. So in the middle of the day, the sun's gonna be right up above you. But early in the morning, when the sun's rising and it's just above the horizon, or when it's setting and it's just above the horizon, and it's at sort of an angle, you can put your subject in a position so that the light is gonna hit them at an angle like that, rather than from directly above. So the light's coming from behind, and then you can create that rim effect where the light comes around the edges. So, I mean, that's one lighting effect you can use. There are many others, um, but lighting is essentially mainly about just having an awareness of where the light is and how, it's, um, how you can incorporate it into an image. So, planning is a huge part of wildlife photography. Um, and knowing locations, I think, is a really important one. Um, so, for instance, you might know that a certain animal um, is in a certain area. Um, you know that they need to they need to drink water. So you might want to just go and wait by down by this this watering hole and just wait and hopefully get lucky that an animal comes and just comes into your vision and you're able to take that photo. Um, so planning, having an awareness of the location, what animals you're likely to find in that location, how they're likely to act. You know, is this animal likely to be drinking water down by the, the, the lake? Is this animal likely to be climbing in trees? Or is this animal more likely to be hanging around on the edge of the cliffs on the rock face because it's a rock wallaby? Um, same with this animal, you know, are you likely to find it in a tree, in a cave or down at the watering hole? these birds uh, is it going to be easier to capture them flying through the sky or could you capture a nice photo of them drinking later in the afternoon because they they drink at you know dusk whatever like so having a having an understanding of the location and what animals are likely to be in that location and um, what you're likely to find them doing and then finding a position where you can planning and finding a position where <clears throat> um, you're able to capture put yourself in the best position to capture a photo of those animals. Um, so weather is another thing to plan for. Um, how do certain animals act in certain weather? Um, do they hibernate, hibernate when it's snowy? Do they come out when it's sunny? Do they um, go swimming when it's hot? Like, think about how weather, um, how different animals research and find out and plan about how different animals act in certain weather. And just because it's a rainy day doesn't mean, sometimes the best photographs can be captured on the worst days. Like, you know, this image here. If it wasn't raining, it would just be a nice photograph of a kookaburra on a stick. But um, that rain adds that extra element of um, feeling to this image because you can picture this kookaburra sitting there on this cold day in the rain all by itself. Um, and it adds that extra level of depth to the image. So having an understanding of the animals and how they act um, in, we in different weather conditions is another um, planning element you need to consider. And then the other thing is time and season. So knowing about, again, knowing what animals are likely to be in what location um, and are those animals more likely to be found at night time? Are they, you know, do they hibernate in winter and come out in summer? Do they come up in the morning, wake up in the morning early to eat grass? And then, you know, do, do they go, do they go flying like bats, like flying at um, sunset time? Like what, 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 the, what is the animal and have, a, have an understanding of what you're likely to find them do during a typical day and then go in there at that time specifically to find, capture that animal doing that thing at that time. So it's not just about rocking up to uh, a natural in habitat somewhere and just walking around taking photos. It's about planning, 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 knowing what you're going to find, where you're going to find it, and what you're going to find it doing, and then positioning yourself in a way to be able to capture that animal doing that thing. And then the final thing you need to think about, well, remember, is patience. So as I said, you're not likely to just rock up to a place and just capture you're not just going to pull up in the car, jump out, and then just bang, take a photo of this bison or deer or whatever it is doing this, you know? Um, or just just get lucky and just see this, you know, in the car park. Like, 
it's about patience. It's about, you know, you have to walk around, you have to walk to find the best spot and the best location. Then it might be a case of sitting down for an hour and a half, two hours, until finally you get the chance to actually take that photo. You might have, this animal might have been sitting there sleeping for two hours and you just sit there just waiting because you know he's gonna wake up. And then you just sit there staring, staring, staring. And then the second he wakes up, bang, you get your photo. You just gotta be patient. Um, so yeah, it's, it, the main things are equipment. Um, and if you don't have the expensive equipment, then then find ways to achieve these same effects, shallow depth of field and long focal length um, using the equipment that you do have available to you. So zoom cameras. Um, lighting, make sure you're shooting at an early time of day or a late time of day so you can create um, more interesting lighting effects rather than just having bland, plain images like this. Um, planning make sure you're planning and thinking about the location that you're going to and what animals you're likely to find and what you're likely to find doing in those locations the weather um don't just limit yourself to sunny days go go when it's raining go when it's go when it's warm go when it's hot go when it's cold whenever just um think different animals act differently in different climates so think about that and, and plan that for that as well and then the time of day and the season is it summertime? Is it winter? Is it raining? Uh, is it morning? Is it night? Is it afternoon? Is it um, sunset, sunrise, uh, autumn? Different times of the year, different times of the day. Animals will come out and do different things. So, knowing knowing what how animals act at different times of year and different times of the day can help you in the planning part. And then being patient is the final thing. Remember to just take your time, be patient, don't rush, and eventually. Um, you will be able to capture a nice image. Patience pays off. What is it? Pa Patience is perfect. No. Patience pays off, whatever. Um, so those are the six key concepts of wildlife photography. Um, a lot of those concepts um, are similar to other things we've talked about in other areas of photography. Um, so make sure you watch a few of those other videos to gain a more solidified uh, understanding of some of those, them concepts. Um, otherwise, thank you for watching this video and I uh, will see you soon.